Good morning, Parks Church family and friends and anyone else joining us. Welcome to our weekly online worship service. We're so glad that you are tuning in and worshiping with us this morning. Whether you're live watching it now or watching it back later on, we hope that you'll be engaged by God's word and his truth in a way that really uh, truly affects you and changes you. We at, Char at Parks Church, um, we delight in Jesus through the ordinary means of grace as a growing family, and we focus on the neighborhoods of West Nashville, specifically the Charlotte Corridor. But wherever you're tuning in from, we're glad you're here with us. Our aim is to embrace, embody, and extend God's mission where we live, love, and labor. And so we know it's uh, an an odd time, but we would love for you to join us if that mission resonates with you of embodying, uh, embracing, and extending God's mission where you live, love, and labor, then uh, we'd love to have you anytime. Today, a couple of things just before we, we jump in. I don't want to get too heavy too quickly, but it's been a, it's been a pretty heavy week, and it's a pretty heavy day. Uh, it's Mother's Day, on, which on the one hand is such a joy to and in a need, we have a need to celebrate our mothers. They have given us so much, and they um, rightly deserve to be delighted in and celebrated today. And yet there's another side of that equation on Mother's Day. So for some, for many, it's a really difficult day, whether it's strained relationships with your mother, whether it's a feeling of loss from not having a mother, or the pain that many feel for not being able to be a mother um, at, at this point. Um, and yet, uh, we, we have somewhere to go with all of that, with the joy and the pain and everything mixed in. And so I know many that struggle to even attend church services on a day like today because of the amount of emotion associated with it. But what Jesus invites us to do and will invite us to do today is to bring all of that to Him and to find um, hope and one that can identify with your joy and with your tears. The other thing that's going on this week um, that I think I at least need to mention is um, the whole goings on in Georgia with the uh, Ahmaud Arbery uh, situation. And, and I say situation just because I want to be delicate to delicate ears this morning. Um, but um, I just want to say that, uh, that we have and are experiencing all sorts of emotions even with that, with the racial turmoil that that has continued to churn and, and reawaken in so many of us and specifically in brothers and sisters um, that are meeting this morning that are truly uh, discouraged and mourning and disappointed and have this feeling and sense of injustice or even rage. And I just want to acknowledge that as well. And to say that no matter where you are, where we are in all of our experiences with all sorts of things like this that are going on in our nation, uh, in our own hearts, in our own lives, we still will come to the place this morning um, of, of finding hope in Jesus. I, I, one of the reasons I'm really... Um, encouraged and glad that we have been led by the Lord to pursue this series on generosity is because the heart of it reminds us of where to go to find the resources we need to engage in a world with so much hurt, with so much um, uh, 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 weariness, um, with so much discouragement. We can only go to one place to find a well that's deep enough, to find the riches and the resources that we need to engage all of the sorts of things we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's what we'll do this morning in our time together in worship, is be reminded of where to go, um, the well that is deep enough to provide for all of our needs. So as we do that, as we prepare our hearts to worship, let me encourage you just to look at the verse that's on the screen and to pray for just a moment to get your heart ready to worship the true and living God. As you notice in that verse, this morning we're going to focus on forgiveness and how uh, the God who has forgiven us gives us the resources to forgive others. And so let me just uh, 
and it point us to the scriptures as, a, as Jesus himself, as God himself calls us to worship. The psalmist in, verse, uh, in Psalms chapter 16 says it this way, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That is enough to call us to worship the living and true God. So let's do so. Let's greet God and one another using the words that are on the screen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise in the assembly of his faithful people. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God help us this morning. Whatever is weighing heavy on our hearts, whether it's the joy of the day or of things that we've experienced this week or the, the pain um, and the discouragement that we have, dis- have experienced this week or maybe a mixture of both. We bring those to you. And we ask that you would help us to worship you as you deserve, and in doing so, to be able to roll our burdens upon you and find the peace that passes all understanding and that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms, tears open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live. The power of hell forever defeated Now it is well, I'm walking in freedom For God so loved, God so loved the world Praise God, praise God Blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God for whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love.
Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is the health and salvation. Oh, ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who are all things so wonderfully reigneth. Shelters thee under his wings, yes, so gladly sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires have been granted in what he ordained? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work in defending. Surely his goodness and mercy he daily attending. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriends. Praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for it we adore. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly for it we adore Him. Now we can move to affirm our faith in this great Savior that we just sang about. I'll ask the question and ask you to respond uh, together with an answer that you'll find on the screen. This is from the Heidelberg Catechism that asked this question, what is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him. God calls us to confess our sins. He calls us to confession with, with freedom. And He calls us to do it like a child. Listen to Matthew 18 at how Jesus describes what it means to come to Him like a child. It says this, At that time... The disciples came to Jesus saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, Jesus put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How are you coming before the Lord today? What the call from Jesus this morning from God this morning is to remove ourselves from the center of our lives and place God there, to come before him in a way that, like a child, has no inhibitions, um, no, um, no fear, but instead is coming in 
a very needy posture and needy way before God, um, asking him to, to meet us there and to, um, to, to meet our needs. And so we come this morning and confess. And let me just pray for us the prayer of confession and ask you to follow along in your hearts as I pray for us this prayer of confession. Almighty and most merciful Father, we are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, deeper than all our sin. Forgive our careless attitudes towards your purposes and our refusal to relieve the suffering of others. Forgive our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of comfort and pleasure, our indifference to the treasures of heaven, our neglect of your wise and gracious ways. Change us from the inside out so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now take just a moment in silence to name your own sins before the Lord. Uh, depending on where that cut out, you may have had a long time to confess your sins before the Lord, which is not uh, the end of the world because we've got plenty to talk to Jesus about. Um, but here's the good news um, of the declaration of forgiveness from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. This is the good news. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. If you're trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation, not in what you've done, not in your record, but in his, then you're forgiven. You are a beloved son or daughter of the living God. And that is good news. So let's respond using these words we find on the screen. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. What love could remember No wrongs we have done I'm missing all knowing not the sun thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. I sense they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than dark. Sins they are many, His mercy is more. What patience for waiters we constantly run. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Since they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, through every morn. Since they are many, His mercy. Is of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Since they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy. More. 
stronger than darkness Knew every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more Stronger than darkness Knew every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more God, I'm on my knees again God, I'm begging, please, again I need you Oh, I need you Walking down these stairs and roads Water for my thirsty soul I need you Oh, I need you Your forgiveness Is like sweet The sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin mm -hmm. Dead man walking, slave to sin Wanna know about being born again I need you Oh God, I need you So take me to the riverside Take me under baptized I need you Oh God, I need you Your forgiveness Is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of The sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin Like holy water on my skin Good morning again and good to be with you in this way. Hope you were able to enjoy some of the beautiful weather we had this week. Here in Nashville, we're at a time of transition. We're beginning to phase out the strategy for reopening. And I'm sure you noticed, just like me, that there is no shortage of opinions on what this new normal post-COVID-19 should look like. Do we wear masks or should we not wear masks? Are gloves important? Are elbow bumps okay? Everything's political. Everything's complex. What organizations or businesses should be involved in phase one, two, or three? We're all, there's just so many opinions. But I did find out this week there's one thing that all the experts agree on, and that is nationwide, what we're sure will happen is after COVID-19, divorces will rise. ABC News surveyed lawyers all over the country, and what they found was that 
law offices in every state that allows electronic appeals and electronic filing, they're inundated already with requests for divorce. This pressure cooker of pandemic life is putting such strain or maybe exposing such weaknesses in relationships that they're reaching the point of what people feel or no return. And of course, it's not just marriages, right? You've probably felt it with your roommates or maybe your children or children. Maybe you felt it with your parents. There's something about the squeeze of quarantine that is showing us how hard persevering in relationship is. Well, what do we do? Here's another thing that experts agree on. From psychology and spirituality, secular and religious, experts across the spectrum agree that the most essential practice in any relationship is the ability to extend forgiveness. That's what we're going to talk about today. This morning's text teaches us how. How can we, as individuals, as a church, as neighbors, as a city, how can we extend a generous offer of forgiveness to anyone and everyone? We find the answer to that question in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. So read along with me as I read God's word. Then Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and for payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then the master summoned the servant and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do it to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Join your hearts with me as I pray for the Spirit's help. Holy Spirit, you have inspired this word written through the hands of people like us. You've preserved this word and now help us to understand it, not just understand it, but to apprehend it in our hearts in such a way that we would be changed. Help us in these words to find our God. Make a name for yourself among us, we pray, Jesus. In your name, amen. So how do we become generous with forgiveness in such a time as this? (laughs) Well, this story, this parable, says we need to do two things. First, we need to recognize the debt that we owe. Recognize the debt you owe. That's the first step. If you want to be somebody who offers generous forgiveness, recognize the debt you owe. We find it right here in this story you could break up into two scenes. The first scene is verses 21 through 27, and that's where we find this. Peter comes up to Jesus, and he asks a question. How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? And he he suggests, seven times? Now look, in his day, the most religious experts would have said this. You should forgive him three times. After the fourth, 
no forgiveness. So Peter's actually being over the top. <laughs> Peter, Peter's trying to stand out as being super gracious here. And he's using a Hebrew word that means uh, it's, uh, seven is the number of fullness or perfection. And so he's saying, how many times should I forgive him? Double what the usual religious people say? And Jesus says, no, no, no. I don't say seven times. I say 77. It means infinity to what you've suggested, Peter. More than what you think. Now, can you imagine can you imagine Peter's jaw dropping like my Bible just did? <laughs> Can you imagine the shifting feet of the disciples in response to what Jesus had just said? They were shocked. And to their stunned ears, Jesus gives this story to explain what he means, to show them that sin and forgiveness in the economy of his kingdom are entirely different than the religious, than the irreligious, than the way anybody else would think about them. Scene one, the king, the master, wants to settle accounts. And so he calls his servant to him. Now this servant owes 10,000 talents. Here's what you need to know about 10,000 talents. In the Greek numbering system, the highest number possible to record was 10,000. Talent was the, the most expensive monetary unit. There was no more expensive financial unit than a talent. So literally what Jesus is saying, the highest number you can think of with the highest amount of money you can think of, that's how much he owed. One Bible commentator said there's no point in trying to figure out with inflation what that means today. The point is, Jesus is saying basically, he owed him a jillion kajillion dollars, an astronomical amount. Okay, that's what he owed. And then verse 25, the understatement of the century, since he could not pay. He could not pay his master. No one ever could, that's the point. The master then orders the servant along with his family and all of their possessions to be sold. Does that sound harsh? If that sounds harsh, what we need to remember is that that was just in Jesus' day. That master had every right in the world to do just that. In fact, that was the cultural expectation. That was his prerogative. No one in his society would have blamed him for doing that. It would have been perfectly reasonable. And yet the servant pleads. Hear the progression. He falls on his knees. He implores or he begs the master, have patience with me and I will pay everything. And the master's response is stunning. He says nothing else out of pity for him. Literally, the words mean his heart went out to him. The master of the servant released him and forgave the debt. This is a shocking story. And the first thing it teaches us is that you cannot understand how to offer generous forgiveness until you understand, until you recognize the debt that you owe to God. But see, you can't understand that. You can't understand forgiveness until you understand what this parable teaches about sin. You know, in, in the Bible, sin is very complex. We tend to think of it in simplistic terms, breaking a rule. But there's a, a wide lexical range of words used in the scriptures to describe sin, iniquity, trespass, transgression, corruption. And here, Jesus uses one that's probably most difficult for our modern ears. He uses debt. Jesus is saying, my sin, your sin, everyone's sin is a debt to God. In an age where we have trouble even acknowledging sin, personal sin, this is especially offensive. So why does Jesus say that our sin is like debt to God? Well, here's the way that we are indebted to God. First, all of us, we are in debt to God as the Creator. Psalm 24 says this, The earth is the Lord's and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it. Acts 17 says this, He himself gives life to all mankind. He gives them breath and life and everything. Just by the simple fact that God is the creator and we are the creation, we are the creatures that he has made, we owe a debt to him. It's a little bit like... Um, Two months ago, when this first started, our youngest child began that, what starts off as a cute habit, of asking why. Whenever we would ask him to do anything, his first response was, why? And at first, two months ago, honestly, it was kind of cute. I thought, oh, this is our last time going through this. Now, two months of quarantine have passed. 
And every time I ask him to put his bowl up or to put his books away, he says, why, why? And this week, I finally reached the place where I wanted to say, because I'm your dad, because I've given you everything, everything you have, I gave you. And because I make the rules here, because you're just a kid and trust me, I'm asking you to do it, do it. It's a little bit like that. We live in God's world. We live in God's grace, every moment sustained by his strength and not our own. Everything we have, the Bible says, what do you have that has not been given to you? We are all in a creaturely obligation to God, our creator. He's given us everything. And not just as creatures, but as human beings, we're creatures made in his image. This means we were made to relate with God intimately, centrally, truly. And yet, how often is God on the periphery of our lives? We weren't just made as creatures made in his image to relate to him. We're made to represent him, to be living pictures in the world of what he is like. And yet, how often will we describe our conduct as a worthy demonstration of the gracious creator of all things? We're in debt to God as our creator. Not just that, the Bible says we are in debt to God as the lawgiver. Hear these words from Romans 3. Paul is explaining to a young church like ours, full of people from all across the spectrum, kind of like ours, about what God's status as lawgiver means. And he says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, the moral code, the Ten Commandments that God gave through Moses, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. And the whole world may be held accountable to God. Now, if I was in that church in Rome, I would probably say something like this. You, oh, Paul, what you meant to say is the Jewish people were under the law, the people of Israel, and therefore they are accountable to God. But I'm a Gentile. I'm a non-Jew. And so that doesn't apply to me. Paul anticipates that. In the same letter, he says this. For when Gentiles, non-Jews, who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. The Bible says that God has given his law to all people. He has inscribed his law, his moral code, upon the heart of every human being. And this is why all of us have an instinctive sense of what's right and wrong. Even though we might like to say what's right for me, I can decide what's right for you, you can decide right and wrong or relative. None of us live that way. This week, uh, one of the women in our congregation had her car broken into and some very valuable things stolen from her car. Now, what have I said to you? I did it. I broke into her car and I stole those things. And, and then she said, well, then you need to go to jail and you need to pay everything back. But I said, no, that's right for me. In my system, my moral system, I don't think stealing is wrong. I don't think breaking people's vehicles is wrong. It's right for me. Nobody listening to this would agree with me. In fact, you'd probably, you'd be more frustrated. And that's because even if we say we can each decide what's right and wrong, none of us live like it. Nobody really lives like a relativist. It's obvious that getting your car broken into and your stuff stolen is wrong. Everybody agrees with that. Why? It's not like that in the animal kingdom. Because our Creator has endowed us with His law upon our hearts, an instinctive sense of right and wrong, an instinctive sense that each of us rebel against all the time. And so we are in debt to God as the lawgiver. Thirdly, if you belong to Jesus, you have a third category of debt. You're in debt to him as the redeemer. You may have heard this story of a young slave woman who was emancipated. This is days right before the Civil War time in the 1600s. And a, a man, a wealthy man, went to the slave auction. And seeing this young woman on the slave block, his Heartstrings tugged at him, and he bid, and he bid again, and he bid again, and he bid again, and he outbid everyone. And she was deemed his property. He walked her away from the slave auction a few blocks away, and once they got a little ways down the street, he turned to the young woman and he said, Young lady, you are free. She said to him, Free? 
Does that mean I can do whatever I want? He said, yes. Does that mean I can say whatever I want to say? He said, yes. And she said, does that mean I can go wherever I want to go? And he said, yes. And then she said, then I think I'll go with you. That's at the heart of the debt we owe God as our Redeemer. Christ has come and paid our debt. And now we're to live not for ourselves, but 2 Corinthians 5 says, but for him who died and rose again on our behalf. Paul writes it this way in the letter to the Colossian church. God has forgiven all of our sins by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing to the cross. It was the practice in Jesus' day for the worst criminals to be crucified, to die a death on a cross. But every cross had what was called a titulus nailed to it. It would have been a record of that criminal's crimes so that everyone passing by could see why the criminal was dying. And what Paul's saying is something was nailed to Jesus' cross. Not just the sign, King of the Jews, that they put there to mock him, but something was nailed there in a spiritual sense. And what was it? It was the record of your debt, my debt, our debt to God. Our sin was nailed to the cross and set aside. We are in debt to him as our redeemer. If you're going to be generous with forgiveness, the first step is to recognize the debt you owe to God as your creator, the lawgiver, and the redeemer. And when you realize how much you've been forgiven, you'll love much as we learned earlier in this service, and you'll be much more willing to forgive. But if you only think you've been forgiven a relatively small amount because you're basically a good person, better than most, you'll always be stingy with your forgiveness. You'll always expect people to earn it. Why? Because self-righteous, self-sufficient people are always in their heart of hearts superior to other people. They'll always make you crawl back for forgiveness. You might see this in your marriage. You might see this dynamic playing out with your kids or your friends. If that's you, you see yourself in this parable as the master, not as the fellow servant. We have to recognize the debt we owe. That's step number one. But the story doesn't stop there. It's a good thing because we'd be crushed by our debt. The story continues with scene two. And this scene shows us that if we're going to be generous with our forgiveness, we also have to receive the grace that God offers. Let's go back to the story. Look back with me at verse 26. The servant here promises foolishly, right? He promises, I have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Unbelievably. Unbelievable mercy the master forgives and releases. And then what happens? That servant went out and he immediately did this. He found one of his fellow servants. He seized him, laid his hands on him, began to choke him and said, pay what you owe. Now, how much did this servant owe? A hundred denarii. That wasn't insignificant. That would have been about a hundred days wages. Think about it as three months salary. So it's not a small amount, but it's nothing compared to a kajillion zillion dollars. It's nothing compared to the astronomical amount that this slave had owed his master. His fellow servant falls down, recognize the pattern. He falls down and he pleads, he implores, He does exactly what the other servant had done. And then, same words, be patient with me. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. It's the same exact scenario, but this servant doesn't act like his master. He refuses and puts him in prison until he should pay his debt. Now, why did one so generously forgiven fail to forgive generously? Or to put it another way, how do we avoid repeating that mistake? What does it look like for us to receive the grace that God offers in such a way that we become generous forgivers of other people? First, it looks like this. First, we have to reject. We have to reject any notion of our own goodness, any semblance, any inkling, any ounce of thought that we contribute anything to God's good viewing of us, the fact that we are now sons and daughters of God. We contribute nothing to that. We have to reject any sense of our own value, our own righteousness, our own ability to earn a place with God. 
That has to be rejected. And this servant doesn't realize that. Be patient with me, and I will repay everything. As long as that is the posture of your heart, I will repay everything, God. You will never know the freedom and the joy of God's grace. You can't. Grace only comes to those, is really received by those, who say, I could never pay you back. Thank you. Thank you. We sing often in our church an old hymn called Come Thou Fount. And there's a verse in that hymn that says this, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor! Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Those are old words. Beautiful words. What's it saying? A fetter is a chain. And what the, what the hymn writer is saying and what we often sing, what comes from our lips and hearts is, God, the only way my wandering heart can be bound to you is by the chain of your grace, your goodness. It's your grace that keeps me connected to you, that keeps me living for you, that keeps me loving and delighting in you more than anything else. Moment by moment, day by day, I'm constrained to be a debt to this grace. It doesn't end at conversion. It's every moment of a Christian's life. Until you reject every ounce of belief in your own goodness or your own ability, you can't know the joy of, of grace, and you'll never offer generous forgiveness to others. You'll always be coldly expecting people to play by your rules. John Stott was um, one of the most famous pastors, teachers, writers of the last century. And he had a very long ministry of publishing commentaries and Bible studies and preaching. And I mean, God took him all over the world to preach to thousands upon thousands of people. In the latter years of his life, he had a research assistant who every day at 4.30 would bring John Stott a cup of coffee. And the research assistant tells the story that every single day he would bring the cup of coffee to Uncle John, as he called him. And every day, John Stott would look up from his books and say, I'm not worthy, with a smile. <laughs> and eventually, the research assistant couldn't take it anymore. And so one day, he drops the cup of coffee off, and John Stott says, I'm not worthy. And he says, Uncle John, of course you are. Of course you are. You know how many people God has used you to bring to Christ? It's just a cup of coffee. It's not even good coffee. Of course you're worthy of this cup. John Stott, without hesitation, said, you don't have your theology of grace right. If you really knew who I was, then any ounce, any, any bit of goodness I experience in this life, even that cup of coffee, is a gift of God's grace. Only when you come to that place can you be generous with forgiving other people. We've got to receive the grace that God offers. That requires us to reject any sense of our own goodness. And then secondly, here's the good part. Rejoice. After you reject, you rejoice. One of the most amazing elements of this story told by the master storyteller is what does not happen. How would you respond if you were in his shoes, groveling before a master to whom you owe a debt that you couldn't pay if you had a thousand lifetimes? And he just forgives you. He says, okay, you ask me. My heart has gone out to you. You're free from that debt. How would you respond? I would pass out. I, I, would, I would sing. I would celebrate. I would shout. I would tell everyone of my master's generosity. None of that is here. His response is to go out in his own frenetic energy and find someone who owes him a little bit of money and start gathering the money to pay it back. He does not rejoice. How can you know if you've ever really received the grace of God that's been offered to you? Have you ever rejoiced in it? I mean, truly. Have you ever rejoiced in the grace that God is offering to you in Christ Jesus? That's what it's like to be a Christian. This man fails to rejoice because he hasn't received. And as one pastor has said, the more you rejoice in your own forgiveness, the quicker you'll be to forgive others. So why don't we? I mean, I'm saying this and I'm thinking of the lack of joy in my own life. Why don't we rejoice? Why do we get so used to the forgiveness that God offers to us in Christ? 
The key is in the words of the servant. Cowering before his master, he says this, be patient with me. That word patient in the Greek is a compound word, and we really don't have a great English word that fits it. The older translations use this English compound word, long-suffering. And because it's made up of two Greek words, one that means, you, you, basically it means you're bearing up under, you're enduring under an excruciating experience. You're persevering through pain. That's what he's actually saying. And here's what that exposes. We often forget that forgiveness comes at a cost. That the pleasure of rejoicing in God's gracious offer of forgiveness came at the price of immense pain. It, it was an excruciating cost. For this master in the story, it cost him a fortune for God to forgive you and me. It cost him infinitely more. Cheap grace, the grace of coffee cups and bumper stickers, doesn't lead you to be forgiving. But costly grace, offered to you at the price of God's own Son on the cross, changes you from the inside out. And you become generous with your own forgiveness. One story that I read recently that illustrates this is the story of Corey Ten Boom. You may or may have not have read uh, her works. Or probably her most famous book is The Hiding Place. Corey Ten Boom uh, is a Christian woman, grew up in a Christian family, and during the time of World War II, her family, uh, being led by their Christian faith, decided to hide Jews in their own home. And they made it for a long time, but eventually they were discovered, and all of them, Corey and all of her family, were taken to concentration camps. One by one, her family perished under the Nazi regime. Corey barely survived. In the post-war years, she spent her time traveling all over Germany and the rest of Europe, sharing her testimony of God's generous forgiveness to her and her grace to her throughout her experience in the concentration camps. One night in Munich, she was speaking about God's forgiveness. When she lifted her eyes and looked towards the back of her room and her heart went cold, she saw an old, balding man in a gray coat and immediately recognized his face. He was the most cruel guard from Ravenstruck, the concentration camp where her sister had perished, the concentration camp where she almost perished. It was him. With her hands shaking, she finished her talk. And then the worst thing happened. She looked up, and he was making his way through the crowd to her. <laughs> And she had nowhere to go. And he approaches her and he says this, thank you for your fine message. How wonderful it is to know that all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. At that point, he says, I, you mentioned Ravensbrook. I'm ashamed to say I was a guard there. But since then, I've come to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It's been hard for me to forgive myself all the cruel things I did. But I know that God has forgiven me and please, if you would, I would like to hear from your lips, too, that God has forgiven me. And he extended his hand to Corey Ten Boom. She froze. She writes about her response in her book. She says, I stood there, I whose sins had again and again been forgiven, and I could not forgive. It probably wasn't many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do, spoken from somebody who survived a concentration camp. For I had to do it. I knew that. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And so one woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder. It raced down my arm and it sprang into our joined hands. And, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. She writes, for a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Corey Ten Boom, this former Nazi guard, both recognized the debt they owed God. 
both had received the grace that God offered to them. And so she was able to extend and he was able to enjoy generous forgiveness. We'd be remiss if we didn't come back to how this story ends. Jesus ends this story with a warning. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Do you know why Jesus says that? He's saying this, what I've just illustrated, is not remarkable. It's the norm in my kingdom. To be in my kingdom is to know that, as Martin Luther said, forgiveness is not just something that sticks in the heart, but it shapes your whole world. It changes everything. It touches and colors every relationship you'll ever have. To forgive like this is not something only exceptional Christians like Corey Ten Boom do. It's the norm. Because God has so generously forgiven us, we can offer that generous forgiveness to all who offend us. After all, we could never, ever, to put it another way, no one could ever, ever sin against us as much or as deeply or as often as we've sinned against God. You are this loved. This grace is real, and it's offered to you. Take hold of it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the master, but you came as a servant, and you died a criminal's death on a cross, and nailed to that cross, cross in a spiritual way is the record of our debt against you, a holy God. There's no way we could ever repay you. We owe more than we know. As the psalmist prayed, our sins outnumber the hairs on our heads. Thank you that you have paid the price for us and offer us grace. Grant us faith. Help us to look to you, Jesus, in faith and to apprehend that forgiveness and then extend it to others that the world might know and see how good you are. We pray in your name. Amen. We have a chance now to respond to God's generosity, his generous forgiveness of us by offering our tithes and offerings. And we, we always like to remind each other of that at our church. I want to thank you personally for your generosity. Thank you for being a generous community and congregation. And you can take a moment now to pull out your phone. You can use the app or go to our website and respond to God's generous grace to you by the giving of your offering to him. Let's use these words to shape our hearts. Because of the generous riches of our inheritance in Jesus, we now freely give the offerings of our hearts to you. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory On his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why 
should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. As we pray for some specific things this morning, let's pray together. God, we're so grateful for your forgiveness. So grateful for the reminder this morning of that deep truth. And we pray that it would stir our hearts in such a way that it's not just good information in our heads, but it's something that motivates our hearts and our actions. We pray we would fall more in love with Jesus because of the truths that we've heard this morning and that that would change everything. We pray for a couple of our families this morning, for Sam and Kate Grayson and for Taylor Dawson. We're so grateful for these, um, these members, these friends, and we pray for them, uh, all of us. We lift them up to you this morning that they would continue to grow in the knowledge and understanding of who you are and how much you love them, that they would experience your grace daily and drink deeply from the well of your love for them, that they would know that Sam and Kate and Taylor would each one in their own special way know that you love them like a son or a daughter because of what Jesus has done. That they would be known because of that as generous people, generous with their resources, generous with forgiveness, generous with patience, all of the things that you work in them. Pray, uh, God, specifically for them that um, that they would this week drink deeply of, of that grace in times with you, that they spend learning from your word and in prayer and communion with you, that you would make them a light in the nation's neighborhood that you've placed them in, that all of the people that they come into contact with would notice something different about them because you've so grabbed hold of their hearts and their lives. Um, minister to them this week, pour out your grace upon them, and use them in their community. We pray for other local churches. We think of Hope Community and of, um, of, uh, of Sylvan Park Church that are both in our neighborhoods. We pray for them that you would continue to be with them in their ministries, um, mainly online right now, but also in, in, as the weeks unfold more and more in person pray that you give them wisdom and grace and pray that you would continue to use them in our community. God, we pray for continued needs in our community from tornadoes and storms, um, from schools being out and from people being affected by, by, um, by those sorts of things associated with this disease. Pray that you would provide relief. Use us, uh, continue to use us in whatever way you will to help provide tangible needs for our our, our neighbors, especially our North Nashville neighbors um, that you've given us deep relationships with there. And pray that you would be a God who brings comfort and, um, and provision. And God, we pray for our world, for all of the things, the hard, difficult things that have, have gone on this week that, that we are experiencing and mourning. We pray that you would help us to be a light and that you would fill us in the midst of so much um, discouragement and and painful things that you would um, put your seed of hope in us because of what Jesus has done, that we would be an aroma of life to a, a cold and dark world. Keep us encouraged. Help us to endure. We pray in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Let me encourage you, as is our habit each week, to stretch forth your hands now and to receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in that peace this morning. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Ah. Uh...